Section 8.4, the integral test. So let's start out with the integral test itself, which is described in this theorem. Suppose f is a continuous, decreasing, and positive valued function on the interval 0 to infinity, closed at 0. Then if we have a sequence a sub n that happens to match up with f of x at all integer values, then I can say the infinite series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n converges if the improper integral that goes from 1 to infinity where the integrand is that f of x function converges. So to repeat that, this infinite series n equals 1 to infinity, let's say f of n will converge if the integral, the improper integral, 1 to infinity f of x dx also converges. The infinite series will diverge if the improper integral diverges. All right, now what I have here in the picture is just a generic picture of a decreasing function in blue, which is continuous and positive. And it just happens to match up at the integer values so that the red points you see would be f of 1, f of 2, f of 3, and so on, and in general f of n, and those coincide with the values of our sequence. So f of 1 is a1, and that's a2, and that's a3, and in general f of n is a n. So we've seen this trick before. We're replacing a sequence by a real valued continuous function that just happens to match at the integer values. Now, what does it do in between those integers? Well, it doesn't matter as long as the function is continuous and decreasing. Continuity will guarantee that there's no major wiggling in between those sequence value points, and decreasing will guarantee that it keeps going down. So what we're saying there is in between these two values, for example, a sub 1 and a sub 2, the function isn't going to take off wildly in between 1 and 2 and do some sort of a massive increase, oops, some sort of a massive increase and then some sort of massive decrease and maybe a massive increase again. It's going to steadily decrease in between those two, and that's essential for this test to work. All right, now if I back up for a second here, uh, we're going to look at the proof, but we can also see from the picture why this would be true. So let me erase this stuff. Okay, so first of all, let's look at this series of inscribed rectangles. So starting with n equals 2, I'll grab f of 2, which would be the same as a2, and I'll create that inscribed rectangle where the area of that rectangle would definitely be a width of 1 times a height of a2. So this would be a2. That would be the area. Uh, since this is n equals 3, and that's feeding in to the function to get me a3, that means the area of this second rectangle would be a width of 1 times a height of a3, which would be an area of a3, and then so on and so forth. So of course when I get to this inscribed rectangle in general, let's say the nth one, you can see that the area of that one would be a sub n. Okay, you do notice of course that if I were to calculate the improper integral, from 1 to infinity f of x dx, it would be the area under the blue curve starting at 1, which would be everything. Okay, notice that just with a simple geometric interpretation, I can see that the areas of those inscribed rectangles I'm talking about, starting with this first one, if you add those up consecutively, starting with the one whose area is a2 and then the area of the one that's a3, the sum, the infinite sum of the areas of those inscribed rectangles is going to be less than the area under the curve. 
So that means if the infinite series n equals 2 to infinity a sub n exists, it would have to be less than or equal to the integral 1 to infinity f of x dx. If I just interpret this in terms of area, which I know I can because this is a completely positive value function. Okay, very simply, I think we can make the conclusion if this improper integral exists, that is, if this equals a number, then I interpret that positive number as an area. And I would interpret this infinite series on the right as the infinite sum of the areas of those inscribed rectangles. And that would have to be less than or equal to the area under the curve. Okay, therefore, if the improper integral converges, then this infinite series on the right would also have to converge because it's smaller. All right, now, question, if this series converges, then does the infinite series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n also converge? And we've mentioned this before. We know what really determines the behavior of an infinite series in terms of its convergence is the tail of the series. By tail, I mean if an infinite series looks like a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 plus and then forever, well, let's say I add for a while and I get up to a sub 1,000 and then I keep going. We realize that what happens in those first 999 terms doesn't really affect the convergence of the series. The only thing that determines the convergence of the series is the tail, which is the end that goes to infinity. So if I were to discard the first 999 terms, it really wouldn't matter what those 999 terms added up to. The convergence of this series, this infinite series, would be determined completely by the tail, which is the part that goes to infinity. Therefore, if this series that starts at an index value of 2 converges, adding one more term to it is not going to affect the convergence. So just remember, uh, seems kind of trivial, but I know this series is just the series that starts at 2 plus one extra term. And so if this series converges, adding one term still gets me a convergent sequence. Okay, so that answers the question in the picture of why when this improper integral converges, this infinite series converges. Now the other side of the picture, let's erase all this. How can I make this conclusion that if the improper integral diverges, that the infinite series diverges. Okay, with a little magic erasing, we're back to the original picture. Okay, so now let's look at a slightly different picture. Let's draw another series of rectangles, but this time let's draw circumscribed rectangles, so the ones that all fall above the curve, which means when I get down here to this interval that goes from n minus 1 to n in general, then it would be a circumscribed rectangle that would look like that. Okay, what's the area of this first one? Well, the function value I'm using to determine the area of that rectangle, the height, is a sub 1. So I'd say the area of that first rectangle is a sub 1. The area of this second rectangle is a sub 2. In general, when I get to this interval that goes from n minus 1 to n, it looks like the area of this rectangle would be a sub n minus 1. So it looks like if I add up all of those rectangles infinitely, as I start at 1 and go to infinity along the x-axis, we're talking about the infinite series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n, which would just be a1 plus a2 plus a3 and then forevermore. Okay, notice that when I sum all of those areas up, I get a total area which is larger than the area under the curve. That is, the sum of the areas of those rectangles has to be less than or equal to the improper integral 1 to infinity f of x dx. 
and actually I see I've got my inequality the wrong way. If those rectangles are all above the curve, I think we need to have the inequality going that way. Okay, so if it does go that way, what happens if this diverges? Then that means this total area over here on the left, which is supposed to be bigger, would also have to diverge. And when I say diverges, I don't mean a non-existent limit, as in one that's bounded but just never settles toward anything. I mean infinite. If the area under that curve is boundless, then the sum of these rectangles which fall above the curve will also be boundless in terms of measuring the area. All right, so when I put these two together, what I've basically got is if this improper integral diverges, this infinite series diverges. If this improper integral converges, same thing, the infinite series converges. All right, now I, I will go ahead and, and skip the proof at this point, the formal proof. I think this is enough to look at this picture. I will say that the main device that's needed in the proof is the mean value theorem for integrals. And when we apply that theorem in the proof, uh, one of the most essential parts in this theorem is that the function be decreasing. Now, it also needs to be continuous. Uh, what does continuity guarantee you? It guarantees you the integral exists. That is, if there is finite area, a continuous function is integrable. So it guarantees me that I can actually integrate this function. Um, what else? Continuity guarantees me that the mean value theorem for integrals will work. And the other thing I really need is the decreasing. So the reason I'm mentioning that, when you go to apply this test, you really do have to make sure that all three of these things are true. Now, authors of textbooks, authors of calculus textbooks, are known sometimes to slip a problem in somewhere in the exercise set where the function they're describing in the problem, or the series they're talking about, when you look at the a sub n and you try and replace it with a continuous f of x, uh, that function might not be decreasing, or it might not always be positive. Now, I don't really believe that's something this author sets out to do, but just be on the lookout for that. Whether it's an actual confirmation on paper or you just do it visually, make sure that the sequence that defines your infinite series really can be modeled by a continuous function that is decreasing and positive. And as we do a couple of examples here, we'll just visually check those things and make sure they work. So let's look at a couple of quick examples just to get the feel for this, and that should uh, prepare you for the homework. So let's think about this example. Infinite series, n equals 1 to infinity, 1 over n to the p. That's where p is a positive real number. Okay, so first of all, when I look at f of x equals 1 over x to the p, which is where I'm basically replacing the n by an x. And I'm doing that just to emphasize that I'm replacing this discrete function, this sequence, with a continuous function. And so now I just ask myself three simple questions. Uh, number one, is this function continuous on the interval 1 to infinity? And of course the answer is yes. Is this function decreasing? Well, we should know that the answer is yes, but if we're not sure, we can always remember that if f of x is 1 over x to the p, which is x to the minus p, then that means the derivative is negative p x to the negative p minus 1, which is negative p over x to the p plus 1. Remember the interval that we're on. We're on the interval. 1 to infinity. Well, on the interval 1 to infinity, this is obviously positive, and we already said p is a positive real number, and so I think that negative right there guarantees that this derivative is always negative for all values of x. Okay, that means this function 
is definitely decreasing. And so if it's ever needed, usually it will suffice to show that a function is decreasing by looking at the derivative and showing that it's always negative. So if it's not entirely obvious that a function is decreasing, just go ahead and show me by taking the derivative that that derivative is always negative. Okay, what's the other thing I need? The third item was, is the function always positive? And of course, 1 over x to the p for x greater than or equal to 1 and p positive is definitely a positive value for all x greater than or equal to 1 and all positive p. All right, so, you know, that will usually suffice for a check, but you do need to make sure you're working with a continuous function. You do need to make sure it's decreasing, and this is the one that you might sometimes have to do just a little bit to confirm for me that it really is decreasing. In fact, when you're doing these problems, uh, it would probably be safe if this was a quiz question or a test question to just show me that derivative and confirm for me that this really is a decreasing function. And then confirming that it's positive should be easy enough. Okay, so I've got a function that mimics my sequence. It matches or satisfies all three of these requirements. So the question is, does this guy converge or diverge? And what the integral test is saying is, all I have to do is look at the improper integral, 1 to infinity, 1 over x to the p dx, where I am simply replacing my 1 to infinity for n with a 1 to infinity for x, and I'm changing that n to an x, and I'm doing a continuous calculus operation now. Okay, we already know the answer to this one. This is the p integral that we talked about back in chapter 6, and we proved that this one converges if and only if p is greater than 1. So when does this infinite series converge if and only if p is greater than 1? Okay, now this is an important example, which is why I'm doing it here in the lecture. This tells us that something like n equals 1 to infinity 1 over n squared converges. It tells me that something like n equals 1 to infinity 1 over square root of n diverges because that's really 1 over n to the 1 half, which is a p integral with p equals 1 half. Uh, we also know already from what we talked about in the last lecture that n equals 1 to infinity 1 over n, which is a p series with p equals 1, diverges because that's just that harmonic series we talked about. And we showed in the last lecture why that diverges. But notice this is actually just a p integral with p equals 1, or rather a p series with p equals 1, which means by doing the integral test, I can confirm that this guy diverges because this improper integral converges only if p is bigger than 1. All right, so before I do another example, let's just say, when is this particular test useful? Well, number one, of course, you have to have these three things. And so if any of those three things fail, then the integral test is out. You need to move on to another test. Usually these three things are pretty easy to verify just by looking at your series. And so if you see these three things are true, and you see that your function is something that's fairly simple to integrate, then the integral test is probably a good choice. Now, what if this function that describes this sequence is not easy to integrate or is perhaps impossible to integrate, then the integral test is a, is a poor choice. Let's look at another example. So let's take n equals 2 to infinity 1 over n times the square root ln n. All right, now first of all, uh, two things to say here. Notice I'm not starting this at 1. I'm starting it at 2. Okay, what did we say when we demonstrated the, the proof visually? We said that what the beginning part of this series does 
doesn't really determine convergence. It's the tail. So if I really start at 2, I don't really care what it does between 1 and 2. I really want to know what it does for the tail, which starts at 2 and goes to infinity. So what we're saying there is we can still apply the integral test even if that lower index doesn't start at 1. It, it can start at any positive number. All right, now once we've sorted that out, now we look at this function. And so obviously we're talking about the function f of x equals 1 over x square root ln x. Um, a couple of things. Number one, it should be easy to see that for x greater than or equal to 2, that this is definitely a positive function. Is it continuous? Well, it's a composition of continuous functions. 1 over n is continuous on this interval 2 to infinity. Uh, ln of n is continuous, or ln of x rather. I guess I should be using x's here. ln of x is continuous on this interval. The square root is continuous at all positive numbers, so that composition is continuous. This division will be continuous as long as that denominator is non-zero, which it's never going to be on this interval. So it's definitely continuous. What's the other thing I need to check? Again, I need to know if this is a decreasing function. Okay, I would say this is an example that I've picked here of one where it is not really obvious to the viewer that on the interval 2 to infinity, the function 1 over n square root ln of n, or I guess I should again be using x's there, it's not really obvious from inspection that that function is always decreasing on that interval. I know the limit of this is 0, but that alone is not enough to say that this function is strictly decreasing on that interval. So this is one of those times where you definitely need to confirm for me that it's decreasing. This is not at all obvious. Okay, so for that, of course, I'm going to look at the derivative, which in this case is what x, I guess ln of x to the 1 half, all to the negative 1 if I just pull everything to the top. So what's the derivative? Uh, it's going to be negative all of that. So x ln x to the 1 half, all the negative 2, and then times the derivative of the inside, which would be ln of x to the 1 half. Uh, plus x times 1 half ln x to the, what, negative 1 half times 1 over x. Uh, what is that? That's negative x ln x to the 1 half to the negative 2 times all this stuff in the bottom, which I guess I'll put that down here. I don't think I have room out to the side. Uh, what is that going to be? It's ln of x to the 1 half. Um, I believe these two x's will cancel, which means I'm just going to have a plus 1 half ln x to the negative 1 half. I understand there's a lot of cleanup I can do there, but I'm not really worried about that. I can see clearly that this part is negative. And I can see clearly that this part is positive if I'm on the interval 2 to infinity. And so that means because of this negative right here, this entire derivative is negative on the interval 2 to infinity. Okay, that confirms that this function is decreasing. Okay, again, once I know those three things, all I have to do is replace this infinite series with an improper integral that starts at the same lower index the infinite series did, goes off to infinity, and it'll be the integral of 1 over x square root ln of x. Okay, let's do that one really quick, which I know would be limit as b goes to infinity integral 2 to b. Um, let's call it ln of x to the negative 1 half times 1 over x dx. And I understand that if u was ln of x du 
would be 1 over x dx. So this is an integral of, of the form u to the negative 1 half du. So if I integrate it, it's going to end up being, what, u to the 1 half divided by 1 half. So 2 times ln x to the 1 half. I'm evaluating that from 2 to b and taking the limit as b goes to infinity, which is limit b goes to infinity of 2 ln b to the 1 half minus 2 ln 2 to the 1 half. And I don't really need to calculate anything because I can see clearly at this point that as b goes to infinity, this part right here blows up and goes to infinity. This part is finite, but it doesn't matter. This blows up. It's positive infinity. Therefore, this series diverges. Okay, in many ways, this is a really useful test, and it is, it is a very simple one to apply. You're just on the lookout for functions that exhibit these three behaviors if replaced by a, a real-valued continuous function. And mainly, we're talking about the positive and the decreasing parts. And again, most of the time, that's really easy to spot. Once you spot it, just look at this function, and if you spot that that's an easy-to-integrate function, then that means this is probably something that's suitable for the integral test. Okay, I'm just going to do those two examples because really any more would just be repeated examples of doing improper integrals. The big thing, again, is just to make sure in each one of these problems that you're observing these three things are really true. And if they are, just replace your infinite series with an improper integral and evaluate. And if your limit exists, you've got a convergent integral and convergent series. If it diverges to infinity, that means your infinite series diverges. Okay, good place to stop, and that's it for section 8.4.